Good afternoon, and welcome to another episode of Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. Likeable Science is all about how science is friendly, accessible, should be a central part of everyone's life. And today we're going to be talking about a, a fun topic. We're going to be talking about dogs. Everyone likes dogs, right? So I have with me uh, Ms. Julie Chen. Welcome, Julie. Hi. Hi, Ethan. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Julie is a graduate student at Johns Hopkins University in Environmental Sciences and Policy. Mm -hmm. uh, congratulations. That's great. She is the author of a recent article, Social Behavior and Structure in Wild and Captive Groups of the African Wild Dog. And this was uh, uh, recently published in the journal Life, The Excitement of Biology. Yeah. So yes. uh, congratulations. It's very, Thank very you. nice to get, a, get an article in a journal when you're a grad student. That's a, a big coup. It's always very good when sort of your work is, is, you know, your hard work is recognized a little bit, you know. Yeah, so yeah always... excellent, excellent. And uh, so your, your work basically uh, is on the wild dog, whose name is? Right. The African wild dogs, Lycoan pectus. Lycoan yeah. pectus, okay. I, I, That's the genus and species, right. yeah. Um, these are uh, uh, wild dogs that live yeah. in Africa, yeah. and um, they're of some considerable interest to yeah. conservationists now because, yes. like so much of the wildlife in Africa, mm -hmm. they are their populations are much less than they used to be. Right, yes. they've run into habitat yes. loss, food loss. Right. Yeah. Right. right. So, what, what, how was you got involved in, in doing this? Well, you know, in my research, you know, I was really interested in, in finding out what kind of behavior differences are sort of captive versus wild African wild dogs. You know, and luckily at our local zoo, um, the uh, Waikiki uh, Zoo, which is a great place, um, they had a pretty full pack there. Mm -hmm. um, and so the point of my study was to really find out, are these animal, you know, do their behaviors, are they predominantly innate, meaning that it's it's really a matter of their DNA programming, or is it learned, you know? Mm -hmm. So there are animals out there which are pretty much, they're born and they know what to do, you know, right. such as a lot of fishes and amphibians. Sea turtles right. are an excellent example. And then you also have animals such as primates and cetaceans that have a long learning period, right. you know? So I wanted to see where African wild dogs kind of sat on the spectrum. Right, because there's this move in conservation yes. now at times to take animals that you've reared in, the, yes. in, in a controlled environment, in right. a zoo or whatever, and then turn them loose, basically. Yes. And an animal which is behaving largely innately would probably do pretty well yes. if released, but an animal who's learned a lot of behaviors, unless you've been very yes. careful about what you've taught it, yes. will do very poorly as soon as yes. it's released, right? And, and Ethan, that's a great point, because the problem, so releasing of captive animals into the wild is very challenging, right. which, whichever animal you're talking about, right? right. And actually, there was a meta-study um, based on mammals that said the release of uh, carnivorous mammals had a 70% mortality rate. Yeah. Okay, so that's pretty high, yeah. right? And these are the same challenges we, we find with African wild dogs, you know? And, but, but the nice silver lining is that if they are more innate, if they depend more on their instinct, then in theory, they should be much easier to reintroduce into the wild, right. and you it's know, very important. You should get a higher success yes. rate. Basically. Yes, yes, yeah. definitely. Yeah. And there's all kinds of interesting work going on with, for instance, some of the condors, they purposely yes. shield them from human contact. Yes. When they're raising, they have condor puppets feeding yes. them. Yes, exactly. You know, so they're learning the right things. So they're yes. learning to pay attention to other condors, not people. Right, you know, and, and that's the important part. So, yeah. I mean, so these, uh, the, the group I studied, of course, they were in the Honolulu Zoo. Right. So. They are a little bit habitualized to human beings because of our presence. You know, we're looking right. at humans. I mean, we're there looking at right. the dogs. Um, but the zookeepers, I mean, they said, you know, they try to keep off limits uh, to the dogs, uh, limit interaction, so mm -hmm. they're kept as wild as possible, right. yeah. you know, and that's very important. Right. Now, lots of people probably actually aren't familiar with, with the wild yes. dogs in Africa, right? right. But Shall we start with, I think you have a picture, you have some pictures. Yes, yes, I do. I mean, we could look at slide one, which right. we could, so that is a, a African wild dog that you see right now. And essentially, yeah. <laughs> and essentially, you could think of them as wild dogs. Right. You know, they belong to the same family as our domestic dogs, wolves, and, and foxes. Um, and you could think of them like medium to large sized dogs, right? They they weigh about like 40 to 50 pounds. Mm -hmm. But what's very distinctive about them is their coat pattern, right? right. They have this uh, distinct pattern of Browns and blacks and whites and yellows, 
And each dog actually has a different pattern. Right. You know, depend. So it's a, it's like a signature, right? right? Just like uh, some dolphins and and whales, right. they all have different fin um, uh, sort of shapes too. Right. The same with uh, African wild right. dogs. It's useful when you're studying them yes, in the wild. Definitely. You can learn to recognize individuals yes, and then yes. track of them. And it watch. does get kind of hard, though, especially right. when they're bouncing around. <laughs> yeah. Right, they're move, moving fast. Yeah. And they look similar enough. That, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, they live across much of Africa, mm -hmm. much of the, not the desert, yes. tricky, but more tropical and mm -hmm. subtropical South, South Africa, right? So they, they're found predominantly in sub Saharan Africa, which mm -hmm. includes South Africa. Right. Botswana has a good uh, population there. There's Tanzania. Uh, there's also, um, I think, uh, let's see, Tanzania, Kenya. Right. Okay. So that area, that's mm -hmm. where they are. So it's sort of more of a drier sub-Saharan kind of landscape right. versus tropical. Right, right. Yeah. Not, not really jungle. But yeah, not really jungle. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and they live, they have a pretty interesting social structure, right? Oh, yes. Uh, right. That's a great question because... So what is very unique about African wild dogs is that they are cooperative breeders. And what they are is, is essentially, in a pack, you only have two members uh, that are breeding, and they are called the alpha pair, right? And, and the whole pack actually comes together to take care of the pups of the alpha pair, which is very in, unusual in nature, right. you know, because um, essentially the other members that are not breeding, they're giving up their reproductive fitness. Right. right, which is a huge no, no, no. Right? right. I mean, your fitness in nature is is pretty much determined by how many offsprings you right. you sort of you, you sort of um, have. Leave, right. Yeah. But in this case, the, yes. those non-breeding offspring are actually relatives, right? Yes. They, they are typically yes. earlier children of that of the breeding right. pair. Basically. Right. Right. So it's super right. interesting, and sometimes um, it's also the brothers and sisters of right. the alpha pair. Right. So the pack, the normal pack, is really comprised of extended family. Right. You know, the mother and the father, the, right. uh, the children, aunts and uncles, right. you know, so very interesting. Yeah, and, but uh, the, the female, as I understand, yes. really sort of controls the whole yes. thing and keeps other females actually from coming into heat oh, and, yes. And, yes. And, and basically sort of controls the whole thing. It actually is very interesting because they, there have been studies that, that, um, that show that the non-alpha members have lower testosterone levels and mm -hmm. also lower estrogen levels. You know, mm -hmm. so they're less aggressive and less, you know, prone to want to breed. Yeah. You know, so only the alpha pair actually ha have elevated testosterone and estrogen levels. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, it's very intriguing uh, uh, yes. stuff like that. Yeah. So, in, within within the larger ecosystem, mm -hmm. they they play in what 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 their role basically is. There. So, um, African wild dogs actually play a very important role in the ecosystem. Um, they are predators, so right. they're carnivores. So carnivores play a very important role because if you look at your basic uh, food chain, right, you have three main levels, right? You have the top, which are the predators, mm -hmm. right? The second are your herbivores, right? right? These are your animals such as your cows and, you know, your deer and your gazelles and right. et cetera. They eat the plants. At the lowest level, you have the primary producers, right, which are your plants, right? right? Now, imagine a world without carnivores anymore, right? right? So what would happen? The world will run amok right. with... Uh, herbivores, right? Because right? there's nobody there to check them. Right. You know, as much as I don't want Bambi to be eaten, right. you know, it's still important that, sure. you know, they don't, their population yeah. do not explode, right? Yeah, there have been cases where they've taken all the predators away and deer populations have, yes. they've eaten themselves into starvation, basically. It's the same kind of right. uh, reasoning with, you know, when the wolves population got sort of decimated in mm -hmm. uh, Yellowstone Park right. and the deer population exploded. Right. And they kind of ate out all the vegetation right. in there. And when that happened, it completely imbalances the ecosystem. Right. Imagine if the world was bare of vegetation. Right. Yeah. That's no more food, right. no more shelter, right. okay? Yeah. And you are calling for a collapse of the ecosystem. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they've seen on a small scale, it really actually yes. did, that the removal of predators really fundamentally alters, it alters yeah. the balance of plant types that mm -hmm. are around. Yeah, all kinds of interesting things. So, so these packs which range from a handful to probably right. 20 or 30 individuals mm -hmm. in, in a big pack. Right. Basically, roam they cooperatively hunt, I assume. Yes, they do. So, I mean, the basic pack, you could have a pack made of, of just a, uh, two, two individuals, the right. alpha pair. Right. And they have been recorded to have about 40 members, but on average, it's 10 uh, to uh, 10 to 20 members, right? right? That's on average. And they essentially have a very tight-knit social, um, social structure. Mm -hmm. You know, they are together and do everything essentially together, mm -hmm. you know? And that's the interesting part of, that's sort of the, the, the core of my research. Right. Yeah. 
they hunt together, they, they, yes. they, they, they do, eat together, right. you know, everything, they live together. Do you want to talk about, show some of those pictures? Yes, I would like to. Um, so if we could go back to slide one. So these are some of the behaviors that I um, examined. So these are the African wild dogs in captivity. Um, here you actually see them, this is called resting association. Mm -hmm. So in the wild, African wild dogs are resting all the time. And it's a form of, of, of social bonding. It's mm -hmm. a very, very important behavior for them. You know, it's kind of like they're hanging out, right. right? They're getting to know each other. So this behavior was exhibited by the captive group all the time mm -hmm. also. And a lot of time they actually hang out in sort of groups based on their gender, uh, their also age, and mm -hmm. also their rank. So right. meaning, you know, dogs of the same age will hang out with each other right. more, right. you know? And let's look at the next slide. So here, this is um, called the greeting behavior. So in the wild, you know, African wild dogs that are always greeting each other, mm -hmm. right? It's kind of like, hey, hi, right. nice to see you. I haven't right. seen you. I miss you, right? right? And it's very, it's also a very important sort of social bonding exactly. behavior. Re reinforces yes. pack. And so in the, um, in the uh, captive group, you see them doing this all the time. They're kind of uh, essentially nuzzling each other's faces. Right. Um, and, and, and there's so many of these behaviors are the same as the wild group. So the next um, slide we have here, so, so playing. So okay. the act of playing is very common also in uh, the wild pack right. of African wild um, dogs. And what was very surprising about my uh, study is that the captive group played the same way as their wild counterparts, mm -hmm. right? So here this is called chase playing, mm -hmm. right? Essentially one dog will be chased by the other dogs and they'll look back, they have this characteristic sort of back of their body is kind of tucked under them, mm -hmm. okay? And so the next slide is also about playing. So here we have play biting, right? Mm -hmm. So the dogs often, they play with each, with each other and they'll actually play bite with each right. other. There's no aggression, right. there's no sort of, you know, um, broken skin or anything, right. but it's essentially sort of like, you know, fun. Right, and particularly younger animals, it's probably established oh, yes. where, where, where yes. they're gonna stand in the pack. Definitely, definitely, all of this is definitely, uh, kind of helps them in sort of figuring out the ranking right. system. Who, who's strongest, who, less yeah. strong, who will, who will yeah. push, who won't. You know, I know, there's also uh, one of the slides at the end, which actually you, you will see more of the coalition formation mm -hmm. of, of, of the ranks. Um, but let's look at the, uh, the next slide. So this is more playing, and here the dog is actually play stalking. So it's actually stalking another dog, and we know here that this is play because the tail is actually relaxed. There's also dominant stalking, where you know, a dominant alpha is trying to sort of exert its dominance, and that's when its tail is straight out. So it's so interesting that even in captivity, they have these very minute, detailed behavior that is identical, with um, their wild African wild dog, you know? Yeah, excellent, excellent. Yeah. And so, um, but I mean, I guess I, I want to circle back for a moment. So why, why African dogs? So I, what, what, was it just your advisors were working on these when you started graduate school? Was it your a long, deep interest in, in these animals? Well, I've always, so I grew up actually in South Africa. Oh, right? okay. So I remember them when I was a kid. I've oh. seen them in person, oh, and okay. I was always fascinated with them. Um, but my research, I wanted to examine, you know, the social structure and behavior of, of animals, you know, in captivity versus, um, versus in the wild, right? And so I had to find an animal that had a very complex social structure, mm -hmm. right? And there were only a few available uh, uh, at the zoo, right? right? Meerkats is one, but right. unfortunately, I wanted to do meerkats, but unfortunately, there was only one individual <laughs> At the zoo, so that doesn't really help. Life. Yeah, <laughs> so that doesn't really help. But so then I thought about African wild dogs, and there were there was actually a pretty full pack yeah. there. You know, so cool. they became an excellent spe specimen. Excellent. Yeah. And we're we're going to dig into this more deeply. I'm told that we have to go to a, a brief break right okay. now. Uh, Julie Chen is with me. I'm your host Ethan Allen here on Likeable Science. We're talking about going to the dogs, <laughs> and we'll be back in one minute. Aloha. My name is Wendy Lowe, and I want you to join me as we take our health back. On my show, all we do is talk about things in everyday life, in Hawaii or abroad. I have guests on board that will just talk about different aspects of health in every, in every way, whether it's medical health, nutritional health, diabetic health, you name it, we'll talk about it, even financial health. We'll even have some of the Miss Hawaii's on board and all the different topics that I feel will make your health and your lifestyle a lot better. So come join me. I welcome you to take your health back. Mahalo. Aloha, I'm Marcia Joyner, 
inviting you to join us on Wednesdays at 1 o'clock for Cannabis Chronicle, the 10,000 year odyssey where we take a look at cannabis as food, cannabis as medicine, cannabis and religion, and cannabis and dear old Uncle Sam. So please join us to learn all about cannabis. Again, Wednesdays at 1 o'clock. Thank you. And welcome back to Going to the Dogs here on Likeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. Thanks for coming back and joining us. Uh, Julie Chen is with me. She's a graduate student at Johns Hopkins University. Just published a paper about uh, the social life of wild dogs uh, in a journal, Life, the Excitement of Biology. Uh, again, congratulations on that. Thank you. So before the uh, break, we were talking a little bit about some of the, uh, their social behaviors. Yes. You, know, you were pointing out there's a, a bunch of different behaviors that appear to be very parallel yes. to the behaviors they exhibit in the wild, mm -hmm. even in this captive pack who have never, never seen the wild, yes. right? Yeah. Um, and I think we had a, a, few more, mm -hmm. a few more pictures showing some more, some more of those. So we have some more pictures showing how, so here we have a parallel running, which is also a form of play. And so in the wild, the dogs do this when they're actually playing with each other. Essentially, they're running parallel, flank to flank mm -hmm. with each other. And the captive group was also demonstrating this very mm -hmm. same behavior. Uh, the next slide. So, okay, this is very interesting. So this gets into the behaviors that have to do with alpha dominance, right? right? So, of course, the alpha, and here it's the alpha female, they have a lot of control over the pack. You know, they decide in the wild, they decide, you know, when to hunt, when to start hunts, when to continue hunts, and when to stop hunts, right? So in this picture that you see here, um, what I observed is the alpha female essentially got up from resting, and she started to head back uh, to the back of the enclosure, which mm -hmm. is where the food is kept. Right. And all of a sudden, all the other sort of her, her children, they rouse themselves from rest, and they start following her single file. Mm -hmm. Now, we have to notice that they're following her single file because that is exactly how in the wild these pack follow the alpha. A lot of time you will actually see them following one after the huh. other. So it's really interesting that, you know, in captivity, they're ex exhibiting exactly the same yeah. behavior. Again, yeah, there's probably a good evolutionary reason for that behavior. Yes. It probably makes it harder for other yes. animals to pick up the scent and harder to tell sort of how, how many of them there are. Right, right. And they're... it could also be like a ranking system, right. you know, who comes first and uh, that would and be, second, that would be right. interesting. Nobody, is it always sort of the same order? It would be change? interesting. Yeah, know? that's huh. definitely that's a potential paper right there. <laughs> <laughs> um, are there? But are there differences? I mean, are there yes. things that you, that you see in captivity you don't see in the wild, or vice versa? So, in captivity, you know, uh, one of the problems is that the animals can't hunt. Right. right. The enclosure is much smaller. So, in the wild, African wild dogs they have a range of three hundred to two thousand square kilometers. Right, they're nomadic animals, right. so they roam the plains. They're running right. a lot of the day. Yeah, yeah, a lot of times, right? So captivity kind of changes this a lot, a lot right. right? They can't hunt anymore. They're fed all the time. They can't really sort of roam around their enclosure very much right. also. And so some behaviors such as, you know, dispersal. Mm -hmm. So in the wild, a lot of the female dogs, you know, that are not alpha, they will actually immigrate out to actually sort of reduce tension in mm -hmm. the pack. They will immigrate out and actually start their own pack. You don't have this in captivity, right? You don't have hunting in captivity. And breeding is also very limited and controlled by you know, the zookeepers, right. right? So the communal cooperative breeding, you don't really see that in captivity. But given that there have been so many similar behaviors, if it was allowed, I would not be surprised if the animals actually acted the same way. Right. Yeah. And you could presumably set up a very large yes. enclosure in an right. outdoor space uh, right. in, in Africa and get a pack who would disperse, who right. would travel around, might split the two packs conceivably. Right. Yeah, and, and you could really see. The, yes, you, you could see. really test it out easily, right. you know, right. to see that, you know, they were born in captivity, if sort of left to their own devices in like a large area where they have to hunt for themselves, mm -hmm. how would they act? And I would not be surprised if their behaviors were very similar. Right. Yeah. And so all this is sort of, it's sort of this is great because it's, it's sort of good news for the conservation of these animals, right? It sort of says, great, even if we yes. lose them in the wild, so yes. you know, we get them wiped out or reduced right. terrible in the wild, if we can keep some remnant populations, yes. even in relatively restricted circumstances, mm -hmm. they'll probably sort of be good to go if we can ever restore some habitat for them. 
right? Yes, definitely. So, I mean, so far I did look into some papers and some people, you know, they, there have been some captive African wild dogs that have been released and they have not survived well. But, you know, but the thing is, as I mentioned before, releasing captive animals into the wild is very challenging, right? right? And depending on where you are on the spectrum, you know, you may need some preconditioning before you are released. Right. So there actually have been a lot of success stories where, um, you know, for example, the African Lion and Environmental uh, Research Trust, they have had a lot of success in rewilding captive-born um, African lions, mm -hmm. right? And the key in what they're doing is that they socialize the pride before they release them. Mm -hmm. So essentially, essentially, they allow the pride to become a functional unit, okay, mm -hmm. free of sort of human interaction. And so when they are released, they know what to do. Right. You how know? to support one yes. another, how, how to interact. How to interact, right. and et cetera, yeah. right? Had some practice stalking, prey. Yes, stalking, uh, breeding, yeah. also the right. social skills that they need, the hunting skills right. that they need, cooperative skills that they sure. need also. And so, for example, if we, I would believe that if we release the, uh, the African wild dogs in our Honolulu Zoo tomorrow, they probably won't survive well, right? right? They've never learned to hunt. They've never learned to survive on their own, right? right. But if you give them this preconditioning right. step, you know, and have them socialize as a functional pack, I believe that their survival rates will be much higher. Right. So if you put them into an enclosure yes. of several hundred acres or several thousand right. acres, add some wild animals, right. some prey animals in there for them to go after, gave them some months or yes. years of this, then they probably could yes. be released with a fairly high right. success rate. Right. Yeah. And so my theory is that, you know, depending on where you lie on the spectrum of, if you're an animal that's highly innate or highly, you know, need to have a lot of learning and training, you know, you could see like how much maybe preconditioning you need. Like for example, sea turtles and amphibians, they don't need any. Right. Like Sea Life Park, they have a great breeding program of, of, of um, sea turtles mm -hmm. and they just release them, right. right? But maybe the African wild dogs are kind of in the middle left here, you right. know? So they need a little bit of, you know, training before they're released, right? If lions can do it, I'm pretty sure the African wild dogs can do it. Right, and then something like a chimpanzee. Yes. Would, be a much yeah, longer, much, much longer. more complex process. Much longer, um, much complex. Dehabituate them from people, habituate them to other chimpanzees, yeah. get a social structure going, yeah. teach them the skills, have them learn the skills they need yes. to get by in the yes. world. Yeah. And especially with chimpanzees or, or primates, they're so interactive with us. Right. It's very hard to, to sort of separate human interaction with right. them. That's yeah. been a problem with a lot of uh, reintroductions is that these animals are so habituated to people, yes. they don't fear people, they walk up yes. to people who were the people who release them, and those people probably shoot them, right? And that's actually <laughs> a great um, point, Ethan, because that's actually one of the problems um, that uh, captive uh, African wild dogs have when they get released. They, the number one threat is being killed by humans, right. right? And also being killed by their main competitors, which are lions and hyenas. Right. So, you know, they're so used to humans that they don't fear them. Right. You know, they may easily go up into farm, you know, a farm where there's livestock, and there you have human-animal conflict. You know, so, I mean, in the past, African wild dogs have been severely targeted by, by, sure. by farmers, you know, right. because they eat their livestock. Right. Yeah. 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 They, uh, yeah. So, uh, where, where, do you, where do you want to take this work? What do, you, what do you want to do with it? Well, I mean, I think another, the next great step for, for, for something like this is to find out what are the preconditioning steps, you know. Okay. Uh, you know, to really examine, you know, what is necessary to make these animals sort of functional in the wild after being bred in captivity, right? Mm -hmm. And of course the challenge is always in conservation. There's always lack of funding, there's always sure. lack of resources and manpower. And so if you could actually formulate, you know, a system that is affordable, economical, and very efficient, that would be great. You know, maybe the dogs essentially just need a, a closed in enclosure with um, their pack, you know, and maybe just like a couple months together, like two to three, you know, and that's enough for them to, to know what to do. Right. You know, or maybe like some small um, other competitors, you know, yeah. like a small lion or something. <laughs> Who knows, right? right. <laughs> the, the thing is, we don't quite know right now. Right. You know, and I think that's another, that's a great avenue for the next step in this conservation. Right, so presumably some sort of a, almost a field test where you yes. would get a much larger enclosure. Yes. You'd minimize your contact with people even further. Right. It would probably take a generation. Any, yeah. Any wild dog who's grown up habituated to people yes. is probably going to remember that. And, not really ever be scared of people. Right, and uh, maybe they but, need but like, they are offspring, right. hopefully, who would never have right. seen anyone, right. then, then it would not, they'd be very cautious about approaching. Right, and maybe they need like, a, you know, some yeah. encouragement to, to fear 
right. humans, you know, maybe there's like, you know, you sometimes you need to make noise around them or gunshots or stuff like right. that. That actually scares and they learn that humans are dangerous, are, are dangerous. they need to be avoided, yeah. you know. Yeah. Which is going to vastly aid their survival in the yes, wild. Yes, definitely. Yeah, it's, 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 it's an odd lesson. That, yeah, <laughs> I know. Uh, lear learning to fear us. Yes, know? I know. And unfortunately, uh, it's necessary sometimes. Right, right. Yeah. Now, and this, I, I mean, I think this gets into yeah, all the, the, the animal releases that you try yeah. to do. I, I mm -hmm. mean, the, the famous one, of course, was uh, Elsa the Lioness in yes. the Born Free many yeah. years ago. Yes. Took that famous book, yeah. But yeah. All the conditioning that she her yes, tried to get her yes, yes. successfully. And, and it was difficult. Oh, yeah. Very I was difficult. taking a single lion and trying to get her out into a social yeah. environment, too. And she didn't have that advantage of socializing her in a. Right. In a like path, with her, uh, because she grew uh, up in like pride. essentially. She didn't have a pride. Right. So when she was released, she had no friends, you right. know, she yeah. had no family. And, and no practice. At no dealing practice. Of, yeah. Of the lions, yeah. So, yeah. Very, very, very challenging. Yes. So, so uh, you are uh, uh, going to finish up your yes. degree? Definitely. Uh, sometime reasonably soon? Reasonably soon, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully in the year or two. Okay. And I mean, I, I would love to actually continue with my studies, maybe do a PhD or something. Uh, you know, my goal is definitely to get into wildlife conservation. Um, you know, I have a love for, for mammals, mm -hmm. especially African mammals, mm -hmm. uh, but also birds, because mm -hmm. you know sure. I have parrots, right, you know, right, and yeah. I always love right. birds a lot. Um, so we will see, you know, like after, I, I feel right now it, it really is a transition time for, mm -hmm. for our planet. You know, mm -hmm. there's a lot going on. Um, there's been mm -hmm. papers coming out that are saying that we may be on the cusp on, of the next mass extinction, right. the sixth mass, uh, mass right. extinction. And that's something we need to think about and worry about, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. All our animals out there, all the right. wildlife out there may all be threatened. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so many species of yes. will start getting a collapse of the whole ecosystem. Yes. Many of them disappear, right? Yes. Yeah. So what would your advice to any young students be if, if they wanted to get into the whole animal conservation right. business? Well, I would say that, you know, it's definitely a work for passion. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's not something for glory or for money, you know, but it, I, I really believe it's worth it. I mean, essentially, you're helping save the planet, mm -hmm. you know. And I think that, you know, experience is, is definitely key. You know, education is very key also. But experience first, you know. Go out there and volunteer, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, volunteer, because there's a lot of people who actually need a lot of help, you know, especially mm -hmm. these rehabilitation programs. Mm -hmm. Everybody's underfunded. There's sure. not a lot of money in, in wildlife conservation. Mm -hmm. So any kind of free time uh, you have and you want to volunteer, go ahead and do it, because they will definitely welcome it, you know. And what you get, um, uh, uh, what you get, is in return is actually great experience, yeah. you know, and knowledge. And when you have that experience and knowledge and couple that with a great education in this background, you're, somebody's gonna wanna use you, yeah, for sure. You yeah. Excellent, well thank you so much, Julia. It's, yeah. been, it's been a real pleasure having you here. I've, I've learned a lot, as I'm sure our audience has, about wild dogs and, and conservation right. in general and great techniques to use. So I, I very much appreciate your taking the time to come by and, and talk with us today. Thank you so much, Ethan, it was a pleasure. And I hope uh, you'll come back. Uh, next week and uh, do another episode of Likeable Science here on ThinkTech Hawaii. Till then.